My name is David McNaughton, and I'm here today with Sam Sennett, one of the developers of ProLocal to Go. We are going to be talking with Howard Chain and Jessica Gosnell of the Boston Children's Hospital. Hello. Uh, Morning. We're excited to have this opportunity to talk to you about some of the things that you've been seeing with mobile communication technologies in your work at Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, it's certainly been a period of incredible excitement. I know, Howard, you were involved in uh, Apple's launch of the iPad 2. There's been articles in the New York Times. So clearly this is a time when there's a lot of excitement and anticipation about the use of these technologies. Uh, Howard, let's start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about why you think there's such excitement about this technology uh, as a means of communication? Well, I think that it's uh, the, the excitement is coming from the fact that it's a mainstream technology. Uh, the price point is uh, very uh, attractive to people. There's a, uh, a, a great deal of, um, of, of uh, applications uh, known in the biz as uh, apps uh, that, are, that are available. And so it... it uh, it, it, it makes it more accessible to people. It's it, the the, um, uh, the screen size, the the uh, multiplicity of other um, applications, not just communication, but uh, educational opportunities, uh, the entertainment value, providing rewards. It, it just has a a, a whole um, multitude of opportunities. And so I think all of those together just makes it a, you know, a, a very unique kind of uh, um, technology. No, it really has been extraordinary to see the reaction from, you know, families and teachers and, you know, the entire field. Yeah, it is. So, um, Jessica, you're at Children's Hospital Boston, both of you. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, what kinds of things are you seeing related to people who use AAC and the iPad? Yeah, I mean, I think both of us are seeing there's probably not a session where the iPad isn't really being talked about, at least brought up or being used. Okay. Um, and, you know, everyone's really excited about it. And that's been a big kind of clinical shift for us, probably where people are either coming in with the equipment or sure. you know, really have done research, heard about it, asked about it. Um, and so it kind of gets brought up immediately as opposed to what you always say, we have like the recipe, you know, people used to come here and we would show them devices and have things here and it's kind of flipped where people are coming in with equipment. Okay. Um, so that's a big, you know, something we're seeing daily. It, it, let me just add, it's not at all unusual for a, a, a child, especially we see it with children on the autism spectrum, for the family to come in with a, an iTouch and an iPad. Oh, interesting. No. W would, were you seeing this with traditional devices, where they would bring in, say, a Dynavox or a, uh, another device? No, and I think... To, rarely. <clears throat> rarely, and I think yeah. to, okay. to, Jessica, to Jessica's point, um, people would come here because we had the secret sauce. And, uh, sure. But, but now, families are coming in, and they, they bring their iPad or their iTouch, and they're asking us, well, what are, the, what are the apps, or what do you think of this app or that app? So, so it's it's it's, yeah. it's changed our uh, it's changed the clinical model a bit. Yeah, could you describe that about your assessment process and your overall model? How does how does the iPad impact that? You've spoken a little bit about it, but how does it work? Well, I think Jess Jess can speak to uh, the 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 uh, the strategy that that we take and 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 the work that she's been doing specifically um, to to keep us uh, grounded. That that it it's not it's not so unusual uh, that we have a whole different clinical approach. We, oh, we sure. like to take the same clinical approach, and I think Jessica really uh, embodies that in her work. So I'd like, I think she ought to talk about that. Great, great. I, I think that, you know, the big focus has been, you know, everyone's excited and they're coming in with their iPads and their apps, but really bringing it back to feature matching and good clinical assessment. So, you know, it's not unusual for me to say, oh, I'm really glad you went out and bought an iPad. I'm glad you have apps. You know, today during today's session, I'm probably going to use the iPad, but we're going to look at other strategies as well. Um, so, you know, really bringing it back to a feature matching approach. Um, and if the iDevice is the right platform, then continuing that feature matching on to pick the appropriate app. 
Okay, so it's putting the iPad and various apps in its place as a tool that you can select from. Right. Okay. Nice. I mean, what's also uh, you know e extraordinary is you know is is the cost factor too. Um, so when you sure. make a suggestion for an application that uh, perhaps it's free or it's uh, it's you know it's three or four dollars or you know at most it's a couple of hundred dollars. That's a that's a very different conversation that you have with a family. Uh, when you're talking about a device that's anywhere from you know two thousand to eight thousand, and now then you get into the discussion about uh, you know reimbursement and insurance and so forth. Not that I don't think that uh, you know third-party payers need to get into this game, but uh, it, it it just changes the, uh, the 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 communication. Oh sure. So uh, I like what we're hearing here that you're utilizing this you know rich tradition of high-quality assessment and feature matching. Considering the iPad, but in some ways it really changes that uh, decision-making paradigm where sometimes you, people might have access to these tools um, because of funding. Um, they might be able to get them quicker or uh, easier because of funding. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, and, and, and as we mentioned earlier, often the it's not a matter of funding because the families show up with the device. <laughs> so uh, that, that, that's, that's certainly quite different than, you know, historically what we've faced here uh, in our center and, you know, across the, across the world. And I think in some ways it's been nice getting, you know, how many people have come, they've waited six months for an assessment. They get the assessment, you make the recommendations, and then the first part's filling out paperwork. Well, that takes two weeks. Then they wait a month for to get the device from the company. Then, you know, it's a month-long trial. So not that we want to, you know, play down the trials or the importance of that. Oh, sure. It's just a faster process. So, you know, on the way home, I don't know how many parents, you know, have stopped and just picked up the iPad on the way home. When they get home, they sync it with their computer, they buy the apps, and then they call you the, you know, the next day, hey, we're ready for therapy. Right. You know, and, and that's exciting that people are kind of following, I feel like following up with recommendations and really kind of getting on board really quickly. Um, Can you walk us through a little bit more about that typical assessment activity? So, you know, I don't know if you could maybe perhaps think of a, a child that would be perhaps be typical of, you know, some of the children that you see and walk us through what goes on within assessment activities. Well, I'll, I'll we probably do a little it, bit different. It's a little bit different uh, in, in terms of our clinical work. I, I, I mostly see children on the autism spectrum. Um, and Jess uh, sees children with more uh, uh, mo motor uh, complications. Okay. Um, so it's it's uh, for for the for the child who has um, um, better motor control. Usually, the child with autism, um, the in many ways the access issue isn't as uh, a big a, 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 a difficulty or a problem in the in the clinical process. So uh, they, they obviously need to learn some of the fine, refined movements of swiping and, uh, uh, how, you know, how to navigate. But that tends to be uh, not a big problem for individuals on the autism spectrum. Mm -hmm. So we don't have the big um, uh, motor issues that we would have for somebody with a physical disability. Um, as far as the, the determination of the communication uh, application, uh, we, we're using a similar process. We need to know their what level of representation. Can they read? Can they spell? What's you know? Can they use text? Does it need to be symbol based? If it's symbol based, what level of symbolization do they use? Um, black and white line drawings. Do they use um, uh, the Mayor Johnson symbols? Uh, do they need to use photographs because at at this point in their life, that's what makes the most sense to them. So we 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 have to use those kind of. Um, cognitive representational uh, considerations. We have to consider their language abilities. We want the device to allow them to be able to build their language. It's, and it's not just an expressive device, it also hopefully is going to help them with their uh, understanding of input. Uh, for the person on the autism spectrum, uh, besides uh, or as an adjunct to their communication is their understanding of the uh, temporal events of the day. So we want to select applications that allows them to be able to put together a schedule, a visual schedule quite often. So um, we, we, we want to consider all of that. We want to see the kinds of 
uh, difficulties the child might have with understanding those temporal relationships, then we want to find applications that are um, suitable for them to understand that, that whole process. So I guess the, the, the bottom line is that we, we, we need to really consider the child's abilities and the, the difficulties that they have, and then we try to match that with uh, this whole tool set, uh, which are the apps and the platform itself. And if it's a good match, then we make the recommendation. And then as Jeff said, um, you know, families will say, well, I, you know, I'm stopping on the way home at the Apple store. So right. that, that becomes a, 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 a very different uh, a time frame than, than <laughs> the, the, the old days <laughs> a year ago. Okay. Interesting. Thank you. And uh, Jess uh, might want to say some a bit about the, you know, the motor issues and how yeah. they, that's going to change. But uh, it's still a, somewhat of a, a, a difficulty for the child with a, you know, a considerable motor complications. Right. I mean, I think that that is in some ways, you know, I think one of the questions maybe down the line was going to be, you know, wh why would you not recommend an iPad? And I think, you know, I think that the motor is a huge piece into why why you're not going to how they access the device. And I think, you know, some of the current technology has better options for maybe increasing the dwell or, um, you know, now we have key, every, everything, like you said, is kind of developing. We're getting key guards. There are more switch interfaces, but um, it's kind of all just still in the early works. So. But, but there's no question that it's, that it's, that it's coming. And you know that uh, uh, the, the issues around, you know, switch placement is going to be similar than whether it's an iPad or any other communication device. However, that said, um, you know, I, you know, if I put my, uh, you know, take out my crystal ball, I don't think it'll be long before uh, switches might become, um, you know, things of the past because the camera recognition of the of the device is going to allow gesture recognition. So, you know, if I move my arm like that, that could be the switch access that previously required me physically touching some kind of a switch. Absolutely. But we're moving into a whole new generation, and you know, it's a, it's just incredibly exciting. Uh, to, to, to think of the possibilities, and they, they, they're unfolding at a pretty rapid rate. Um, how have you dealt with that information explosion? So clearly we're in a very different world from the time when there was a small number of manufacturers and you would become familiar with your options, and you know, that whole question of feature matching was, was more simplified because there was you know, fewer options to really consider. Now we're in a world where, um, you know, Sam, I think you were joking the other day that two communication apps with the same name came out in the same week. So clearly people are, you know, uh, generating new ideas at an incredible pace. How do you try and manage that information explosion or do you have any suggestions for our audience? In our model, I, I, we feed Jess a lot of coffee. So <laughs> um, it, you know, you hear about a lot of it, uh, but uh, when, when we, as a, as a group, um, especially in our augmented communication group, uh, when new apps come out, Jess kind of leads the charge and, um, you know, starts to, dis dis to discuss them. And then we do an analysis and try to put it into a growing chart. And you might want to talk about that. I mean, I, I think, you know, we're all, we're all good, good in a sense of collaborating. You know, people are Googling, hearing things from other people and just doing a good job of, you know, keeping each other in the loop. So sending lots of emails, hey, this is an app, you should buy it, you should check it out, or it's been loaded on this central iPad, you can go look at it, um, and then let's discuss it on Wednesday and, and talk about what we think about it, what we like about it, what, what are things we will want changed, or who we could maybe use it for. Um, so I think it's, you know, a kind of a group effort with everybody just kind of talking a lot. Um, but it's sure, I mean, I think it's also been really hard to keep up with. Um, you know, and I'm sure we've missed stuff, and I'm sure other people know things that we don't, just by the nature of how hard it is to keep up with. And we're also we're, we're trying to create. Uh, Jess is growing a, uh, a a feature matching chart that tries to keep up with the apps as they come along. I think we've stayed pretty much stayed on top of it. Uh, we're we're out lecturing and talking about it, you know, at, at conferences. And learning about it and reading about it, and so it's you know it, it's it's a process, but there's there's just more of it. And you're right, it it, it requires um, more of a time commitment. But it, it I think eventually, uh, as it all settles into a, 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 a the, the 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 new model of uh, you know clinical care, 
Um, I think we'll find ways in which the uh, the apps, as they become available, will get some some uh, will go through some review, and their good features will be listed, and we'll put it back into a clinical model to match what the child needs with what the apps offer. Okay, okay great. So we want to shift to intervention, and we talked a good amount about assessment and this process of feature matching. Once these individuals and their families have a system, you know, whether it be an iPad or another system, um, you know, how are things working specifically um, with ongoing development of language, with ongoing supports for someone using an iPad with an app? Um, well, well, I think that uh, in 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 many ways there, there's certainly some similarities. It's not like we have a whole new paradigm for how we're intervening. Sure, uh, sure. But I think that uh, that the the intervention is um, it, it seems to be um, used more often in, in in various environments. There seems to be a um, uh, greater willingness to do some of the programming. There there are some there are some other issues around intervention that I think are worth uh, noting. First, um, because there's so many exciting um, other opportunities on the iPad, it's sometimes, uh, at least certainly for children who are somewhat, uh, can become somewhat um, uh, obsessed with, with um, the, the entertainment, uh, they're, they're sometimes reluctant to go to their communication application because they want to look at YouTube, they want to uh, play some of the uh, interesting games and other uh, puzzles and, you know, uh, other, other uh, uh, applications that that are um, you know more of an have more of an entertainment value, so that that sometimes can be a problem. Uh, I think what's also quite clear, at least clear to me, is that uh, all of the intervention materials of the future are are, are you know anything that's pictorial that that has a you know a visual base you know. I think we're going to see um, these materials going to a an electronic format. You know, to be fumbling through a card catalog trying to find stimulus pictures for the intervention, I think is going to change when you can organize all of that, uh, you know, in some photo library and bring up your materials. So sure. I think that, that's certainly going to be, be somewhat different. I heard this great story a couple weeks ago. Um, the Autism Cares Foundation in Pennsylvania is hosting this seven-week series of using your iPad with your child for, for parents. And... What's, uh, what I thought was so interesting is they said that for the first time that they had seen, uh, it was almost all fathers coming in with their child. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that for both, uh, you know, for all parents and caretakers, um, there's an interesting connection there for ongoing intervention and for, like you said, working with other apps. Have you seen uh, much around that uh, area of engagement or interest and in, in increased interest by families? Well, I mean, I, I think that because the uh, the technology is so mainstream, right. I think people just simply feel more comfortable with it. Right. And once they understand how to sync it up with their computer and how you, how, how, how information, or how, the, how the apps are downloaded, once they get comfortable with that, that piece, and that's really, uh, you know, that's, again, that's a very mainstream uh, way of, of, of uh, getting information and retrieving information. You know, anyone that's used uh, iTunes understands the whole concept and, you know, that, that's, that's taken over the world. So uh, that, that's, that's a big difference. And I think the app use, um, you know, using kind of fun, motivating apps to get kids to use communication strategies. Maybe their communication tool isn't the iPad. Maybe it's a communication notebook or just topic displays. But using the iPad platform to get parents to actually use those strategies has been, you know, a big shift, I would say, in something that I'm seeing a lot of where, oh, I use, you know, a POG app during the session with a topic display. And the dad in the session downloads the app that I'm using and is like, oh, can you make a photocopy of that topic display? I'll use it when I get home. You know, little things like that, that they're just, you know, easy excitement, they're used to the platform and, and really wanting to use it and carry it over at home. 
Yeah, and another another um, aspect of this that I find interesting is that it's, it's there are things that we do certainly with children with autism. If we just want to give them a visual cue, um, we suggest that that uh, families create uh, f folders in their i uh, <clears throat> in their iPhoto library that has to do with the playground or uh, or activities around the house, and you can retrieve that folder and show the. Uh, the photo in a very easy way. You 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 grab that photo in an easy way and show it to the child. So you, you, it's not necessarily an app. It's just a feature set, part of the feature set of the device. Yeah. And now that most of the devices have cameras, the iPad to the iPod Touch and current iPhone, it's really in some ways the Tango had a camera, but not many other devices have previously had cameras. Right. The, right. the camera, in a, you know, for a child who, who's autistic, for example, and, and is, has their iPad uh, uh, 2, and they want to capture what they, the daily events, they can snap a picture, come home with it, show their parent, and, the, you know, a picture truly tells, says a thousand words. It has a thousand words. And so, uh, you know, to be able to capture that, now we have something to talk about. So there's, there's all these interesting ways of using it. They don't even require apps. They're just part of the feature set of the device. Yeah. Um, Jessica, can you talk a little bit more about what this technology has meant for adding vocabulary and helping a child develop language over time? Um, has it gotten easier? Has it been about the same? What have you seen with this new technology in terms of the device being developed over time? Yeah, I think in some ways um, it parallels to what we were doing with dedicated devices. I feel like I'm not doing um, many things different. I'm still giving them, you know, a vocabulary checklist and we're talking about what vocabulary, you know, we still really want the device to be customized to meet the individual's needs. Um, I do think that in some ways it's been a little harder where a lot of the apps currently have less of a language system. Mm. Um, Maybe now that touch chats out, there's more of like a word power system, but a lot of the apps out there aren't based off of maybe a lot of research or more language-based systems. So that has been kind of a struggle talking about, okay, how are we going to add core words? What's the progression? You know, do we have to actually create this and then um, modify everything we've done and start from scratch? Or is there a way to kind of really think big and hide buttons? So, so that vocab, that has been kind of a struggle or something that really has to be discussed with parents in customizing and setting up the devices. I, I might want to add uh, also with, if I, again, putting on my, uh, my futuristic uh, goggles, and I don't have to look too far into the future, um, <laughs> the, the uh, ability, because the, the, the iPad has a GPS, um, to be able to walk into one location versus another, uh, it, it once the vocabulary is is known for that particular setting, uh, the the device is going to be able to automatically switch the vocabulary depending on the setting in which you're uh, located, okay. Okay. and so that's kind of a you know a, almost a no-brainer in terms of uh, what what vo vocabulary access is going to be like in the future. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's already an app that does some of that, but it's just simply going to get better. I mean, imagine what it's going to be like three, four, five years from now. And I think people are continuing to think about the fact that, you know, we, we need some sort of language progression and in, in really looking at language in place. And so I think just app, you know, the nice thing is you buy the app and you get the free update. So as app developers are kind of continuing to collaborate with other people, I think there are just going to be more page sets that are really focusing on, uh, you know, language intervention and how can we expand language. Well, let's talk a little bit then about representation um, and, and what we see as, as ways of representing the language that's within the system. Uh, Howard, I know you've been very involved in your you know, research over time with the Visual Immersion Program. How has your research there informed what you're doing clinically? Um, well, it, we have a field study going on now uh, where we're uh, actually applying some of our uh, visual principles in you know in real settings in, in schools and um, we're trying to study the, the the changes as a result of really an immersive environment at school and home and in, in the community and what this uh, technology allows us to do along with other uh, electronic media it just allows us to be able to um, access information more quickly to be able to to use different uh, uh, uses of the device in different settings. We, we do video modeling using an iPad in right in the 
uh, in the in the environment. Um, if we're using a, a static scene queue, we can pull that out of out of a library. If we're using dynamic imageries, uh, that's all contained on the on the device. Uh, the the families again are much more comfortable in using the technology. Uh, it 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 just makes it uh, easier to use these uh, emerging technologies, this electronic media, this mobile technology in in different environments, and it just seems to be more accepted by more people. Um, so where do you think this is all going next? And I'll turn this over to the three of the three of you. I mean, what would you most like to see? And are there any, Howard, you've discussed a few of the things you think are on the horizon. Where would you like to see this go? And what are the, some of the things you see coming down the pike? There was a time when I could, you know, look ahead and, 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 and really, uh, you know, get envision some um, some opportunities that the future was going to hold. I mean, I certainly see things that need to be, you know, need to be created. I've mentioned, um, you know, uh, movement uh, detection for switch access and GPS uh, opportunity to be able to uh, locate where you are and to change vocabulary. But um, I, and, and, you know, now that it has camera capability, uh, you know, I, you can say, well, I'd like it to get more rugged. I'd like the speakers to be a little bit louder, but I'm running out of uh, ideas, and it's 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 just it's 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 happening so quickly. Uh, uh, it, it'll be exciting to see what sort of the next generation is. I will say that the the, the communication uh, apps that we're going to see in sort of what I consider to be the next round is going to bring us into a whole new generation of, of technology. The the technologies, the apps that exist now are not un much unlike what's been developed for some of the dedicated devices. But the future holds uh, some, for some interesting, and in, in we're certainly going to see changes. And it's going to be exciting to, to watch that unfold. I, I have to chime in. Um, recently in the ASHA Perspectives special issue on mobile technologies, um, one of the writers, David Chappell, um, spoke about the need for alternate access. He's a man who uses a head tracking system. Um, I think that's such an important area to focus on. One of the great things is that Apple's developed the voiceover system for accessibility. Typically, we think about that as benefiting individuals with vision impairments so that they can have it as a screen reader. But little did we know that it's a whole accessibility framework. So I'm really excited that voiceover is there. And as we harness it, can be very easily harnessed for switch access. And then it can be very easily harnessed for all kinds of other alternate access. So um, that's one thing that I would say that is really important going forward is not to have alternate access come later or as a secondary afterthought, but to have that be right up there you know, alongside any developments we're making. Uh, because there's just too many people who have significant access needs that are uh, a barriers created by having to touch a screen, especially a capacitive touch screen. So we've done some great things with stylus tools and adapting stylus tools, but really important to get the alternate access down. We talked about switches, um, about head, eye gaze, um, various alternate uh, pointing tools and selection tools will be available if we, if we build it. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. And I think, too, the um, big thing also, like with um, restrictions, like keeping, you know, pe a lot sure. of people talk about locking kids into an app. And I would look at it more like just being able to turn off certain apps at a certain time, maybe with some sort of password or restricting them and saying, okay, these are the five apps you get to use, your communication app, your time timer, your visual schedule. So if you lock them in one app, you're you're kind of losing some of the functionality of the iDevice platform, that integration of functions. So, you know, being able to just restrict access to maybe the ones that they're perseverating on or the ones they're going into a lot and maybe having that as, oh, you can work towards going into Starfall, but for right now I'm going to hide all of these apps. And that, I'm sure, is hopefully something that's coming down the line. Yeah, time lock would be great. You know, school hours, um you know, there has to be an override button if you're going to go up to recess and want to play some games with your friends. But other than that, you know, some people need that as a uh, structure. Right. Um, it's tempting to watch YouTube videos and 
play Angry Birds. Right. <laughs> right, which is what Jess and I are going to do when we finish this conversation. <laughs> Good timing. So as we come to a close, <laughs> I guess I do just want to remind people about some of the resources that were out there. I'm going to list a few, and there may be additional ones that people want to mention. Um, you know, as Sam had mentioned, there was recently a, an ASHA perspective special issue on uh, the use of uh, mobile technologies, and, and, and Jessica and Howard, I know you contributed to that. Um, there has recently been an RERC white paper on the use of uh, mobile technologies that is available from the AC RERC website. And there is also a full-length webcast uh, by Howard discussing his research on the Visual Immersion Program that's also available on the RERC website as well. Uh, uh, other resources that people want to mention? Uh, well, the chart that everyone <laughs> keeps talking about <laughs> has updated that we're, we were going under web reconstruction, so the new web page is now up there and they said as soon as the new web reconstruction had launched they will now work on putting up all of our materials so Good. it should be up they have all the materials you know it should be up shortly that's that's going to be on the children's hospital uh, center for communication enhancement uh uh website great so we'll link to that as well okay. well good well uh, yeah thank you very much for thank you. taking the time it's great to speak with you both just talking to you, you take you care too. thank you bye-bye